Sorry, all the best people are clumsy. Many moons ago, um, when I was a swimmer, I never believed talking to you um, as a cyclist. My career in sport probably started with the inspiration of the Los Angeles Olympic Games and think about what I had as my challenges and my inspiration, uh, my ambition. It was to be a British athlete. I just wanted to be a British athlete. I was absolutely obsessed with those games, watching the way the athletes behaved, the way they prepared for their events, the way they celebrated their events, the way they conducted themselves in the medal podium. Uh, and the way that they spoke to the press about their endeavours and their hopes and dreams of the future and how they felt the events had gone and how excited and relieved they were that they'd come away with the, the medal that they had. Um, I never believed at that point that I'd be knocking on the door of my eighth Paralympic Games. Um, if I make it into Tokyo next year, that will be Games number eight. And it's quite a nice number. I've done four as a swimmer and this would be number four as a cyclist. One thing that really struck me um, when I was a kid was that I didn't really notice the, the elements of technology within sport. One of the other things for me was that I didn't even know the Paralympic Games existed back in 1984. It wasn't until 1992 that we started to get some highlights programmes um, on the television. And then that built and built until we had uh, coverage in, in Sydney online, um, in Athens and Beijing online, a little bit more on mainstream television, almost wall-to-wall -wall coverage um, of almost every sport from Channel 4 in the Paralympic Games in London in 2012. I also think across my career, technology has had a, a growing impact, if you like. When I first started as a swimmer, swimsuits were very, very simple. They were just the cosy that you'd buy for your child to go swimming in now to learn to swim. The, they hadn't invented all the different materials. Uh, swimming hats were still latex swimming hats. The silicone hats came in at some point during the 1990s, I think. And they were a godsend because they stopped your hair from being pulled when you were trying to put your swimming hat on. And you didn't need quite as much talcum powder. The, the, the shark skin uh, uh, area of, of swimming, the full body suit. So now we're almost back to a, a traditional swim costume with mu much more regulation around the type of material um, that you can have there. And in 2005, when I switched sports from swimming into cycling, um, a whole new world of technology appeared. And we have a little joke in our family that I'm the one who does the accounts and the, the stuff online, and, and my husband is the mechanical, mechanically minded person. Cycling, though, created a completely different challenge from a technological perspective, because there's far more scope for adaptation in a sport like cycling compared to a sport like swimming. Technology is an enabling thing within para-sports. It's also got a huge safety element. We use technology in training that we perhaps wouldn't use in competition. We can use technology for technological, technique refinement. So when you're thinking about the type of uh, margins between the gold and the silver medal, or even just making a final, um, technique refinement for the athlete, swimming specifically, Technique can be huge and it can make a massive difference to something. Uh, on a bike we talk about being able to go around corners that little bit quicker uh, and you don't need any more extra watts to be able to do that. So technique refinement can be absolutely huge. And then of course there's the technology that we work with in competition and, and each sport has regulations around the type of technology that can be used. And I touched on it with, with swimming there, um, being a fine example and cycling has a huge amount of uh, regulation around what we can use in competition. So from an enablement perspective, um, when you're looking at parasport, there's all the different range of disabilities and impairments um, that the classification system brings. Um, so we can look at enabling someone to do an activity that perhaps they couldn't do without that piece of technology. So maybe the technology replaces a missing limb, but that enables them to have a more similar technique to the technique of a non-disabled athlete. It can also be, in paracycling, um, a short piece of uh, carbon, usually in cycling, that allows that person to rest with two points instead of having just one hand on the handlebars. And that balance, again, is really quite key, especially if you're hurtling down a mountain into a corner and you want some stability um, on that bike. It can also um, replace missing functions. So you might uh, often think about um, prosthetic legs, and so if you have a, a hip or a knee joint, you can use the technology within the prosthetic leg um, to replace the function that you don't have because that limb isn't there. 
We also enable para-athletes through the adjustment of standard equipment um, and so they had to use uh, some camera technology to, to identify where those fractures were and how likely they were to be dangerous uh, with the forces that the guys are putting through off the start in the kilometre, standing start, or at the top of the banking when they're winding up to do a flying 200 metres. Um, previous to this they discovered uh, a weakness in the the wheels so the, the technology of the, the double disc is that it's more aerodynamic but the problem was they'd stiffened up every other aspect of the frame that even brought more heavy tubulars so that when they um, were riding they weren't likely to puncture and they'd invested in some really strong glue to enable those not to come off the rim but the problem was the weakness was then on the bit just inside where the glue was in the rim um, and if you put Tandem Crash into YouTube a little bit later, you'll see a, a rather shocking um, example of what happens when a piece of equipment fails crashing YouTube. It's got the most stars. I'm not sure whether that's because people like the results or just the, uh, the fireworks that went off. My husband was the pilot of that Tandem, but basically the front wheel disintegrated um, until the point he couldn't handle the bike anymore and they flipped over in the home straight uh, 10 days before the games in Beijing. Um, we were picking splinters out of bottoms and trying to make sure the guys could get back on the bike in time to race. So as I've said, you can adapt a standard piece of equipment and that tends to be what happens with myself. Um, I was born with just one functioning hand and although I've got a small wrist, um, it doesn't actually have any function on a bike other than as a resting point. You can also create an additional piece of equipment um, and I do, I have this problem sometimes. If you slip off with the hand that isn't gripping, then it obviously throws the bike balance and you can end up um, on the floor, which isn't ideal. Everything within para sport um, is always going to be bespoke because no two disabilities are ever the same. And I get a lot of emails um, from parents of young children asking about the way that you can adapt equipment. And unless it's using something that's standard like a brake splitter, everything needs to be made to fit the person um, that's using it. So one of the things I have to help me with a standing start on the track and also to help me with my cornering on the road is a special little hoop that's been moulded to the shape of my little hand. And the bones in my hand and the shape of my hand and the little digits that I do have are never going to be the same as somebody who's got a similar looking hand. So we make bespoke equipment all the time. There's various different companies that will make it for athletes. And some of them are just for function in general life and some of those companies have gone on to work in the more elite area and they've got into the aerodynamics of the equipment as well. With, even with bespoke equipment, there's also regulation standards that that equipment has to make. So in cycling, we have a lot of um, rules around what you can and can't do with the frame and they will often pass on to the um, adaptation as well. So for example, a prosthetic leg that you might see a rider like Jodie Cundy wearing it will still have to comply to the what we call the three to one rule. We can't have any overly aerodynamic things. So you're not going to find the nose cone of a jumbo jet on the front of a bike. Equally, you're not going to find it on the front of a leg because that might enhance the airflow and be an unfair advantage. Some of it's a little bit raw. It doesn't have to be the most inventive thing with when I went to my very first professional race um, out in Belgium and it had a few more cobbles during the race than I was expecting. And I went round the course. I'm a little bit concerned that I might lose my hand off the bars because I can't see what's coming through when I'm in the middle of the bunch. So what can we do? I'm not allowed to tie myself to the bars. That's one of the regulations. You can't have something um, that you put your hand into that's permanently attaching it to the bars. It have to be able to come loose in case uh, of a crash. Um, and that little strap is actually a toe strap. And then every now and then, um, if I hit a bump, it catches my hand before it completely falls off the bike. So from a training perspective, there's lots of things we can do with technology. For example, when I was a swimmer, I had a problem um, with injury and uh, my right shoulder was always overworked. My right hand was always overworked. I had compartment syndrome in my right forearm because my right arm was pulling more water than my left. And so I decided to start wearing a paddle on my left hand side to try and even up the amount of water that my left hand was pulling or my left arm was pulling compared to my right arm. And it made a massive difference. But of course, I wasn't allowed to race with that paddle on as well. So we can do some things in training that we can't do in competition. 
and that's fine. And one thing that happens in training that perhaps people don't realize or touch upon quite as much is the benefit, uh, the neurological benefit of going quicker than you will do in a race. Because if your body is, or your mind is capable of processing that information a little bit faster um, than you are in training, you'll be used to being able to do that. For example, in cycling, we use a motorbike on the velodrome and we can do motor pacing around that track at a higher speed than we would be racing at. Some of the times we will do that where we jump off the bike and we, we jump off the motorbike and we do a lap by ourselves. Um, we call that uh, points race training because at points race every 20 laps there's a sprint lap. And then you'll go back up to that high speed, sat on the motorbike, taking, uh, allowing the motorbike to take the wind for you and it'll take you up to a much higher speed. Obviously those things aren't allowed in competition and sometimes you'll see in a bike race a rider pushing away the motorbike with a camera on it because it's getting a bit too close. And all of these things allow us to just train that little bit faster and that little bit better and that ultimately benefits us when we get into a competition. It's also um, it's much more inclusive. So for me, when I was training with that um, hand paddle on, it allowed me to train with swimmers that perhaps I wouldn't normally have been able to train with because they were always so much quicker than me. And I always uh, uh, sort of frustrated me to a little bit that I could do repetitions in training that were way quicker than I would have done without this hand paddle and I guess that just gave me that knowledge that yes I, I was disadvantaged quite significantly certainly in swimming and uh, by having just one hand it was much more quantifiable by those times that I was putting out in the training pool. It's always thought that we're quicker moving when we're under the water because there's a lot less going on. It can just be in a more streamlined position. They've worked on different classifications for this because um, in swimming, there are swimmers with learning disabilities as well as swimmers with various different physical disabilities and also visually impaired athletes as well. Um, so they can decide whether or not the athlete has the ability to train themselves to go that little bit further. So some of the athletes with a learning disability, they struggle to um, work out exactly how many kicks they need to do and when to surface. So they'll look at other ways to um, stimulate that athlete to be able to think, right, now's the time that I need to come back up to the surface and start my swimming stroke. With a visually impaired athlete, they obviously can't see where the flags are. So they'll work on the kick counting as well as the stroke counting to be able to make sure that they're at their optimum level. And then the different disabilities, um, depending on whether it's an amputation, cerebral palsy, so there's mus muscle differences, they'll also work out whether that athlete needs to adjust their flight um, and entry into the water, and that will then adjust the depth that they go to. And then depending on how well the legs function, they'll decide whether they need one, two, three, or even no kicks. Because obviously with some athletes, the legs aren't working um, effectively at all and they're going through the water with a much lower body position. And one of the questions I had for British Swimming when um, I was talking to them about this particular piece of technology was, can you use it for um, constant evaluation so that you know when a swimmer is at their optimum? Or can you then link it to a gym program so if it's a matter of strength in their legs, once those legs have got stronger from that jumping position, can they then achieve a different trajectory in the air, therefore a different entry point into the water, and it always has a knock-on effect. And that is absolutely the case, so that the swimmer can see the benefit of that strength training that they've done, and then they can take it back to the um, technique side of things and say, okay, we can go for an another kick now, we can go for a higher um, takeoff from the block, we're going to enter the water, we have got the strength to go that little bit deeper, um, and the start is a, a really fascinating part of the, um, of the event because even for the longer events, if you can take two or three meters out of your competitors off the start, then that um, can have a massive knock-on effect, even if you're perhaps not the fastest swimmer. Not all technology is going to be to totally refined as well. For the most part, and wherever it's possible, we are always looking within Parasport to make it parallel to what we see in Olympic sport with their technology. Now, marginal gains is something that often crops up specifically when you're talking about cycling. So the concept of the aggregation of marginal gains, put quite simply, is that if you're looking at your performance, you can spread out a piece of paper on the carpet with every different element of your performance in order to take it forward to the next level. Now the improvement that you make may only be half a percent if that, but when you add together and you aggregate all of those small tiny margins, the aggregation of that is something a bit more tangible. 
and it might be that there's 200 pieces and you only do it by um, you know, a very small margin, but there's a 10% improvement in performance. And technology is a massive part of that. She's in the same straight here as she crosses the line uh, through the one kilometre mark. She's at one third distance and she's closing in. Well, what a superb ride this is going to be from Sarah Story. She broke her own world record in qualifying this morning. She's not going to need to break a world record here. She's not going to need very long at all. And this final is over already. More glory for Sarah Story. Britain's greatest female Paralympian strikes again.